Hello and welcome to another episode of Hashtag Disruption Dialogues, a Markets and Markets podcast series for growth-minded strategy, market intelligence and competitive intelligence professionals. Hello and welcome to another episode of Disruption Dialogues. I'm Pranjal Sharma. I'm an author based in New Delhi. And I'm going to be in discussion with Enrique Pastor. He's the Global Sales Vice President, E-Mobility Division at Schneider. Thanks, Enrique, for joining us today. Thank you, thank you, Pranjal. It's, uh, it's my pleasure to be here with you today and, of course, uh, to discuss on this exciting uh, business of electrical mobility. That's exactly the topic, Enrique the impact of growing EV infrastructure on buildings. And I think that's the real issue here because we will now see in many countries, and I can speak for India, where EVs uh, are, you know, at the verge of becoming mass market products. So at homes, in offices, on the road, near gas stations, we need the charging environment and ecosystem everywhere. And that's really the key issue. Uh, And I'd like you to help us understand how uh, much time does it take? How big is this effort likely to be across the world? Okay, good. It's a very good question. And one of the key points that we need to address really to make sure that this uh, revolution, you know, as we call uh, REV, Evolution, uh, it's uh, it's going to happen. So one thing that is very clear, and we see that when we adopt an EV, you know, as a passenger vehicle, typical passenger vehicle, but it's the same thing with when we talk about fleets, is that stopping to charge is not very convenient. You know, nobody likes to to go to the petrol station to go there just for the sake of, of being in the petrol station. So some clear trend that we see as the EV adoption becomes uh, massive is that the EV drivers, they prefer to charge the vehicle when they stop. So what does it mean? I mean, we need to take into account that typically a passenger vehicle, of course, it varies from country to country, but a typical passenger vehicle is sleeping more than 90% of the time. So we buy a pretty expensive asset to keep it doing nothing during 90% of the time of the life of a vehicle. So you can imagine that during this time that the car is stopped, I mean, at the end of the day, it's more convenient if during the time that this car is stopped, it can charge. And this is why if we think of ourselves, where we pass the most of the time of our life is really either at home or working or um, shopping or, you know, so this is the typical behavior. Again, there are different use cases, but if we take the most typical behavior of a person today is that. So we typically sleep at home. So we have the car uh, sleeping either in the street or in our parking for a few hours, eight, 10 hours per day. And then we go to work. We can take, depending on the city, again, we can do 20 kilometers or 100 kilometers. But at the end of the day, we do a certain number of kilometers. We go in our job in our work and then the car again is stopped and you know so typically we think and we have seen in some studies that 90 to 95 percent of the charging sessions and the energy consumed in the ev uh, adoption is going to happen in buildings basically in, in residential industrial and commercial buildings in any kind of buildings when we are at home when we are at work or when we are in a hotel or shopping and the electricity consumed can become really up to 40 to 50 percent of the total energy consumption of the building so this is a clear again revolution this is something that will change completely the behavior of the buildings and we need to prepare the, the buildings for that if we just let it go like this very soon, you know, especially in a building, everybody starts with a pilot. So when you put two or three chargers in a building, there is no problem. The moment you go with 50 chargers, then you might have a problem. So this is where I want to come in and ask you, there are going to be concerns from the, if it's a residential area, concerns from the people who are staying there that how do you account for extra infrastructure? What is the cost? Who's going to pay for that cost? Uh, There is also the impact on pulling more electricity through the same wires. So are the residential areas prepared for that extra power consumption? Uh, There is also going to be standards and common charging points. Maybe there are different vehicles may have different charging standards. So it seems to me that there is a lot of complexity involved, even though it sounds like a very simple idea of putting charging points in a building. Yeah, indeed. Uh, I mean, it's not something simple for sure, but probably uh, Pranjal is simpler than it looks also. When you start thinking about that, it's not maybe as simple as putting a charger and then it works, And but it's not so complex neither because typically when you start really looking at the real use case and how much people are going to charge every day, you realize that probably you don't need all the energy or, or all the power that you think you are going to need. And, and I explain myself. 
Typically, the standard number of kilometers that somebody is making per day is around 20 to 50. Again, it depends on the city, depends on the country, depends on the use case. But a typical person living at home and working in its workplace, we can do 20 to 50 kilometers per day. So today, the vehicles, they start to have ranges that are even reaching the 500 kilometers. Some cars are at the 200, 300, but up to 500. In this case, you can imagine that you don't need to charge your vehicle every day, or at least you don't need to charge your vehicle fully every day. So you can decide to charge your vehicle every day, but you will charge only 50 kilometers. And the amount of power needed for that is not maybe that much. And again, not all the cars will charge at the same time on the same place. So this is also something that we need to think about, that the use case today is just you go, you plug your vehicle and the vehicle starts to get charged. This is not the future. The very near future is what we call smart charging. So it's different, applying different technologies and different, I would say, rational to make sure that not all the vehicles are charging at the same time, not all the vehicles have the same power. So it depends on how much energy you need and when you need your car charged. So this is what the industry we are working on and is the next small disruption or the, the next evolution on the charging of the vehicles. We are seeing that a lot in, in Europe now. So more and more buildings are becoming now more full of EVs. Of course, there is a need of upgrading the electrical infrastructure, but in many cases, and this is part of the use case that we are starting to see, not as much as people think. You know, imagine you put 50 chargers, 22 kilowatt in a building, if you multiply 50 by 22, it's one megawatt. And right. I can tell you, you don't need one megawatt. You will probably need only 200 kilowatt power. Enrique, you made a very interesting point that all vehicles don't need to be charged at the same time. But how are you going to manage that? Is there a technology solution for it? In fact, my larger question to you is, what kind of technologies are being employed to manage this entire new ecosystem so that the charging points, the process for it, the ease of usage for the consumers is kept in the center. Yeah, exactly. The technology already exists and it's being applied already in the most advanced countries uh, like uh, Norway, like uh, Germany. I mean, the countries that started before on the EV adoption, these technologies already exist and are getting applied now. And one of the key things, Pranjal, here is the digitization. This evolution of our life is not going to happen without digitization. The key topic here, and this is a big, uh, probably the biggest disruption that needs to happen here is the buildings, they have to become digital. So Enrique, when you say a building has to become digital, what does it mean? Because obviously the building will remain in a physical form, but some aspect of it is going to be digitized. Yes, exactly. I mean, especially the, the way how to manage the energy consumption of the building should become digitized. And you can imagine how many different systems you have in a building. You have the air conditioning, you might have the lighting, you might have the pumps, different systems. All these systems, they should work coordinated. Otherwise, when you start, the typical thing that can happen if you don't create a kind of smart charging or a kind of digital environment to understand how much the building is consuming and you just put chargers and cars charging, typically at a point of time, the building will trip. You will not have enough energy and enough power to be given to all the loads at the same time. So this is where digitization comes. And this is where the need of a load management system, of a system that is able to manage the load according to the need and according to the criticity of this need should be put in place. And this is exactly what companies like ours, like Schneider Electric, are working and are, uh, I would say, uh, experts on to really put the right digital systems to manage efficiently the energy to make sure that you don't have any problem when you electrify your transportation and you electrify your building for that. So Schneider's role, uh, what are the various business models emerging on this, Enrique? Because I'm sure Schneider has to work with the, the apartment owners. You have to work with the construction companies. You have to work with real estate organizations. You probably will have to work with the municipal organizations of various exactly. cities because the investment for digitizing, the investment for creating new charging points, somebody has to make that investment, somebody has to plan it and somebody has to design it. Who is exactly. going to do that? What are the models which are emerging? So there are a few different models. Clearly, first of all, we have where it is more clear is when we talk about what we call the charging at destination. Of course, the part of the charging in transit at the street that is driven by the governments, by the municipalities, this is also pretty clear that in this case is how to monetize that. 
So the point is we have seen different business models. You can imagine a retail chain that uh, they want to attract customers that are going electric. The way to attract these customers probably is to make investment. It can be small at the beginning and it will depend on the technology you use, especially on the AC chargers. The investment needed is, is much lower than on the, on the high power chargers. Okay? And at the end of the day, normally you go for shopping, not for five minutes. You tend to be uh, in, a, in a shopping mall or in a retail chain for half an hour, one hour, you know. So you have enough time to charge at least whatever you need to come back home or to even more than that. Okay. So typically, one way of looking at that is what is the return on investment of this investment? And this, typically, the commercial buildings, they are starting to understand in, in many countries that they can attract more customers if they do this investment. And of course, at a point of time, they can start monetizing that because not everybody is going to do this investment, not at the same speed. So some customers also would prefer to go, even if they need to pay a small quantity, they can decide to go to this retail shop instead of this other one because they have this facility and they don't need to go anywhere else to charge the vehicle. So this is one use case. Another use case typically, and, and we can say the same thing for hotels, for restaurants, okay? Another use case is, of course, municipalities. So municipalities, they have clear targets. The countries are deploying clear targets on the sustainability targets to reduce the carbon emission. And this is getting deployed, is getting cascaded into the cities, the, the states and the cities, you know? So this is driven a lot by these uh, global agreements uh, to reduce the carbon emissions and the global CO2 footprint. And they need to do investments to support this uh, EV adoption from the people in the cities. And then, of course, for the houses, again, if you take the total cost of ownership of buying an EV, investing in infrastructure and the cost of maintenance and running the EV, if you take the total cost of ownership for people, we are estimating that in Europe, for people making more than 20 to 20,000 kilometers per year is becoming cheaper now, already in 2022. And as the price of the electric vehicles continue to go down, okay, after this crisis that we are going now, typically we expect the price parity of the vehicle itself to come around 2025. So as the price of the batteries, the vehicles goes down and the range goes up of the vehicles, this investment and this total cost of ownership becomes more and more positive for EVs. So it's not only about sustainability or being green, it's also about economics. So the economics are starting to work. You're right, actually, you may have heard that uh, recently, Tata Motors and several companies based in India have launched very affordable EVs. So the price of EVs are uh, reducing. Going we down. have yes. in in emerging markets. In fact, that's my other question. That you know, the you talk about Scandinavia, but you know, there it's about a few hundred thousand people to take care of uh, who yes. would have EVs. In countries like India, in in uh, East Asia, uh, we would have you know, we talk about millions now. Yes. Doing what you're suggesting at scale is equally important because if you want the emerging markets to adopt EVs, then the new consumers, which are in, in you know millions and millions of them, they need such EV infrastructure across uh, emerging markets. Yeah. And therefore, the models and the technology and the role of digitization would have to work at a completely different level. Any exactly. experience or ideas from Schneider on this? I know Schneider is very big in emerging markets, including India. Yeah, in fact, uh, in, in India, we are starting to explore also what are the next steps. So it's clearly India, it's a bit, uh, as you said, is, uh, and I've been a couple of times there. So I'm not an expert in India, but I know the difference. So it's clearly a full uh, different picture in itself. So India is clearly the first adopters of EVs are the two wheelers and the three wheelers. So India has started, uh, companies like Ola, they have started really on the two wheelers and on the three wheelers. I think at the same time, and this is valid not only for India, but everywhere, this transition to EVs, uh, Pranjal, let me, let me put it like this, is not only about one-to-one. -one. It's not only about replacing my ICE vehicle by an EV, you know? It's also by changing the way we move and we understand the transportation. It is clear that the number of vehicles that we have today in the world is not sustainable. The way of consuming vehicles today in the world is not sustainable. You know, if somebody was looking at the Earth from outside, they will think that the Earth is, uh, I mean, the, the, the inhabitants of Earth are vehicles, you know, and this is not sustainable, you know. As I said, 90% of the time, the, the vehicles are stopped. So do we really need to go one by one? 
the question, and we are seeing this reaction also in, a lot in Europe now, this kind of uh, new business models like uh, car sharing, carpooling, uh, rental vehicles per hours, per minutes, is becoming more and more strong. Why? Because the vehicles are a bit more expensive to, to buy. So the capex, the initial investment is more expensive. So not everybody is ready to do that. And at the same time, people are getting conscious that probably they don't need two vehicles at home. Maybe one vehicle is enough. And the second one, you can rent a vehicle if it is available for a few hours when you need it. So our way of understanding the transportation is also transforming. And of course, we have experience already, uh, Pranjal, in countries like, uh, like India. India is our fourth biggest market in the world for Schneider Electric. So, you know, we, we did an acquisition of uh, Larsen and Tubro, the, the LNT part of, of in, in India. So, yeah, we are exploring all the possibilities to support the country to, for this electric vehicle transition. And we have the technology and we know how to do it. So it's a question of going step by step and trying to put all the pieces of the puzzle together. Perfect. So that's that's great to know, uh, Enrique. I realized that, again, you know, for uh, the business leaders, scale is important when they're looking at emerging markets and, uh, you know, value is important when they're looking at uh, legacy markets. I think there's, there's going to be some effort to create uh, flexible models. And I think uh, your experience is important. And therefore, my final question to you is, Enrique, that in the next few years, your personal vision as an expert on this uh, subject, how do you see is the best case scenario? What are the challenges and opportunities you see? Good. So yeah, as a final question for me as a, as a summary, eh? I think we, we are in front of, of a disruption that is going to happen. So this is not something that is optional anymore. So it's a must now. It is very important to consider that, as we said, eh, the, the charger is only the visible part. So we need to consider the full ecosystem the low voltage, the medium voltage, the electrical distribution and the digitization of this electrical distribution to make it happen. Only by adding chargers, it will not happen. So we need all the rest. And this is where companies like ours, we claim, we say that we are the digital partner for really energy efficiency. And so we need to digitize the installations, the buildings. We need to make sure that we take into account the whole ecosystem. And the EV is just an addition to the ecosystem that for sure is going to increase a lot the consumption. We need to consider for sure that the business models and the way we understand transportation is going to evolve. Okay? And if we go a bit beyond the coming 10 years, so maybe after 10, 15, 20 years, there is also a revolution and a, and a disruption that is going to happen. That is really the adoption of the autonomous vehicles, you know? So, Again, this is starting already in some cities in US, in some cities in the Nordics, in, in certain countries. But this will be the next disruption, because when, when we will start seeing step by step in different use cases, probably in trucks, probably in buses, probably in some, uh, I don't know, vehicles that are taxis, for instance. When we will start seeing this um, adoption of, of auto autonomous vehicles, again, the business model will change. So maybe this I'm going a bit, uh, a bit too far in the, in the time. For the short term, for the next 10 years, it's sure that EV adoption is going to happen. We need to upgrade digitally the electrical distribution installations. Okay? And, uh, and of course, we need to think if today's way of seeing transportation is sustainable and how to cope with it. Enrique, thank you for sharing this. Uh, this is a fascinating conversation and uh, there is uh, so much more about EVs that we can talk about. And uh, I think yes. consumers now are seeing it, uh, businesses are now feeling it. Uh, we see vehicles on the roads across the world. So it's no longer a theoretical discussion. It's something which is very rooted in practicality. So thank you for sharing exactly. your thoughts and your experience with us. It was my pleasure, Pranjal. I hope it was informative for the people. I, I really enjoyed also discussing with you. So it was my pleasure. And of course, we can be hours here discussing about uh, immobility and the, and the potential implications. Uh, I hope what we discussed today uh, is useful and, and understandable for, for our colleagues. So thanks a lot. And for all of you who listened in, thank you for your time. I was in conversation with Enrique Pastor. He's the Global Sales Vice President of E-Mobility Division at Schneider. Stay tuned for more such interesting conversations and episodes on Disruption Dialogues. Thank you for listening to Hashtag Disruption Dialogues. If you are a strategy or market intelligence professional, we invite you to join our community on LinkedIn, Hashtag Disruption Dialogues. <laughs>